if you want to blow up your bench, here's what to do, step by step. I'll explain why each step works too, so you can understand what makes this technique so effective. At the end of the video, I'll summarize the optimal bench press technique and give you cues, so stick around. First, safety. No, no suicide grip. The risk isn't worth the reward. Second, whenever you have access to them, set up safeties. If you don't have them, get a spotter. Has your gym bro deserted you, and there are no safeties. Generally, keep at least one left in the tank and practice bailing out of the bench safely. If you do fail, you have two options. First, the roll of shame. Simply touch the bar to your chest and gently roll it down, sit up, and you've achieved the roll of shame. Second, the side bail. For this technique, do not add clips to the bar. Instead, if you find yourself in trouble, let the weights slide off the bar sideways under control to unload the barbell. Finally, if you train in a commercial gym, another option is to pause the bar on your chest and get someone's attention. Great, now that you know how not to die, let's talk about equipment. We need to make sure the equipment is ready so we can bench press effectively. Ensure the bench is grippy enough that your shoulders won't slide. If you tend to get sweaty and the bench is slick, you can try wearing a t-shirt, especially a grippy one like this one. Additionally, to make the bench grippier, you can add a yoga mat on top of the bench or wrap a couple of resistance bands around the length of the bench. Next, set the bay hooks to the proper height. For many, benching out of a rack will be better than using the typical commercial gym bench. The height at which the J-hooks should be set will depend on the length of your arms and grip width. But generally, we want to set them so that you only need to extend your elbows a couple of inches to unrack the bar. This will minimize fatigue from unracking, allowing you to lift more weight when you actually start lifting. If you set the hooks too low, you'll simply create fatigue and lose scapular positioning. Speaking of scapular positioning, let's set up our shoulder blades to bench press effectively. Retracting our scapula allows us to reduce the range of motion slightly, making the lift a bit easier. A simple cue to think of is pinching a pencil between your shoulder blades. Besides retraction, you can either elevate or depress your scapula. This is mostly personal preference. Play around until you find something comfortable and strong. Anecdotally, people who prefer touching lower on their chest tend to prefer scapular depression whereas people with a higher touch point tend to prefer just retraction or retraction with slight scapular elevation. Now that you've set up your upper back, let's talk about getting tight and setting up your arch. There are two approaches for arching in the bench. In the first technique, you first set up your shoulders, then your legs. Use the rack or bench to hold onto and create tightness in your upper back. The bar should be over your face, somewhere between your forehead and mouth. I like it directly above my eyes. Setting yourself up correctly will allow you to unrack the bar easily without hitting the bar against the rack during the set. Once you've set up your shoulders, keep holding the rack or bench and use your legs to push your hips towards your shoulders. Use the cue chest to the sky as you do so to maximize your arch. Arching works by getting your chest higher, minimizing the range of motion on the bench press. This is especially important since most people fail the bench around the mid-range, a few inches off the chest. If we can arch to make this position stronger, we should be able to bench more. The second way we can arch is the opposite sequence. Set your hips first, then push your shoulders towards your hips. Start with the bar roughly over your throat. In that position, lock your hips in place by driving your feet through the floor and push back against the uprights with your hands to push your shoulders towards your hips. Drive your chest to the sky. The bar should be over your face now. Which of these two techniques should you use? Try both. I personally find the second nicer, but it comes down to personal preference. Next, we'll tweak your foot position. A good starting place is to set your feet out to the side as far as possible, directly underneath your knees. This should feel like a strong and comfortable position. It will make it easy to get a good arch, feel like you can drive your feet through the floor with power, and still allow your whole foot to remain planted on the ground. If you find your heels tend to lift, consider weightlifting shoes particularly if your powerlifting federation requires your whole foot to touch the floor. Two alternative foot placements exist. The first is to set your feet just slightly in front of your knees and to the side. This is the most comfortable position, but tends to result in your feet slipping. It also doesn't allow for quite as much of an arch. With that said, it can allow some lifters to use more leg drive, so give it a shot. Finally, if you would like to prioritize maximizing your arch over maximizing leg drive, and your federation allows it, you can try setting your feet as far back as possible. 
I only recommend this if you have great flexibility, enjoy this technique, find an arch more useful than light drive, and you're a competitive powerlifter whose federation allows it. Next, let's talk about grip width. Did you know that nearly all top competitive powerlifters use as wide a grip as their federation will allow them to? There are some exceptions, but around 1.5 to 2 times shoulder width is the strongest and most comfortable grip width for most people. If this grip width currently feels weaker, keep at it. If you're coming from a close grip bench to a wider grip bench, it can often take a few months to adjust fully. What about wrist position? Adopt the bulldog grip. The bar should rest in the lowest part of your palm, directly above the base of your thumb to the bottom of your hand. This will minimize the moment arm on the wrist, which can help if you're experiencing difficulties gripping the bar or some wrist discomfort. It can help to think of punching this guy. You wouldn't punch someone with your wrists cocked back. Now that we've locked in our legs, upper back, arch, and grip, we can finally unrack the bar. First, if you have a spotter, use the countdown system. Go three, two, one, then use your combined powers of friendship to unrack the bar. Ask them to lift an inch or two, then smoothly bring the bar directly above your shoulders and let go. A bad spotter can mess up your tightness and position big time, so make sure you instruct them well. If you don't have a spotter, you'll need to set up a bit farther back on the bench. To facilitate unracking, I like to bring my hips up briefly while I unrack. Additionally, I like to flare my elbows a little bit as I unrack, before tucking them again before lifting. Some lifters find it helpful to think of using their lats. Before you start the lift, make sure you tighten all moving parts. Push your feet into the ground, make sure your hips are touching the bench, bring your chest to the sky, retract your scapula, and squeeze the bar. Now, we're finally ready to lower the bar. Elite benchers tend to take around 2-3 to three seconds to lower the bar. This can help ensure you don't misgroove the lift, or end up out of position. The most common cues to help during this phase are to bend the bar or rip the bar in half, both of which remind lifters to maintain good back positioning. If your arch tends to collapse as you lower the bar, a good cue I personally like is chest to the sky. Once you've lowered the bar, touch it fairly low on your chest, somewhere between the nipple line and the bottom of your sternum. As a heuristic, the closer your grip, the lower you should touch, and vice versa. An easy way to practice this is to apply chalk to the bar and wear a black t-shirt. After the set, you should see a solid line of chalk on your shirt. Power lifters need to pause the bar on their chest. There are two styles of pausing. The first, more common type of pause is the soft pause. As you lower the bar, have your chest reach the bar, not the bar reach the chest. Let the bar rest very lightly for a second, maintaining tension, then drive it back up. For most people, this is the type of pause you should use. The second type of pause is the sink pause. This one is a bit less common and hard to pull off, but is typically used by heavier lifters and lifters who use a closer grip. This technique is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it can mean trouble in competitions, since you need to hold the bar steady during the pause before the judge will let you press the bar back up. It can also increase the chances that you might get called for heaving if you get a fast press call. Sinking the bar makes this tougher. Additionally, since you're letting the bar sink, you're increasing the range of motion slightly. On the other hand, it can let a lifter use greater leg drive and increase strength off the chest by extending your spine as you press the bar off the chest. Now it's time for the hard part, actually lifting the weights. Drive your feet through the floor as if you're trying to push your whole body back on the bench. This is called leg drive. As you start pressing the bar, flare your elbows out to bring the bar back over your shoulders. This J-shaped bar path is commonly used by elite lifters. By bringing the bar back over the shoulders as quickly as possible, you're reducing the moment arms that you're fighting against, increasing your efficiency on the bench. This is arguably the most important part of the bench press. Much in the same way you can overhead press more than you can front raise due to a simple concept called moment arms, pressing the bar back then up will allow you to bench more. The longer the distance between a joint axis and the line of force, the greater the torque your muscle will need to produce to overcome it. Adapting to this bar path can take a few weeks or months, but it will very likely make you stronger. There's one more thing to pay attention to, intent. On each rep, lift the weight with as much force and power as possible. Previous studies have consistently shown greater gains when moving through a lifting phase explosively, as hard as you can possibly do. One study found twice the bench press gains when doing this versus pressing the bar intentionally slower. As promised, here's a cheat sheet of each aspect of great bench press technique and what to do, alongside an effective cue. Now, 
I anticipate you have questions. Since we put out the full 100 page how to bench press article, you've asked many questions. First, how should you address weaknesses in the bench? There are three places lifters commonly fail the bench. The most common and normal place to fail the bench is the mid range, anywhere from a few inches off the chest to nearing lockout. This is the hardest part of the movement. Broadly speaking, there are two things to focus on if this is where you fail. One good bar path. Keep focusing and honing the J bar path. Especially for beginners or intermediate lifters, you may have a tendency to press the bar up off the chest versus back, making the lift less efficient, which catches up with you in the mid range. Second, you probably just need to get bigger and stronger overall. This is primarily true for more advanced lifters who have their bar path down already. Specifically, grow your pecs and triceps via different pressing variations. We have many videos on building muscle on the channel, so I won't go in depth here. Go check some of those out. Next, we have lockout. Failing at lockout is relatively rare, but it does happen. Typically, it's down to two things, elbow position and or general tricep and pec strength. Near the top of the rep, you should have internally rotated the shoulders to make the lift easier on your triceps. Your elbows should be facing away from each other, not towards your hips. Alternatively, experiment with using a bit less scapular depression. Depressing your scapula shortens your pectoralis major, reducing how much force it can produce. Reducing scapular depression can put your pecs in a stronger position, allowing you to grind through the lockout more efficiently. If this looks good, you likely just need to get stronger overall, particularly in your triceps and to a lesser extent, your chest. Finally, the least likely failing point is on or right off your chest. If you fail off the chest, it probably has to do with front delt strength. Because of the moment arms involved, this is by far the hardest part of the lift for your front delts. Grow and strengthen your front delts. Alternatively, you might just be touching your too low on your torso, increasing the strain on your front delts. Growing your front delts via incline pressing or other front delt focused movements, growing your pecs and triceps more generally, and touching a bit higher on the chest are all valid ways to remedy this sticking point. Another common question revolves around the new IPF bench press depth rule. The bottom of your elbows needs to reach the same level or lower than the top of your shoulders for a bench attempt to be successful. How do we achieve this? Well, if you're someone who struggles to achieve this, there are a couple of options. First, simply decrease your arch. Second, touching a bit higher on your chest and flaring your elbows a bit more on the descent. Finally, adopting a closer grip can also help. Experiment with these three changes to tweak your technique until you find what's strongest while allowing you to reach depth. Finally, you may be interested in what the best bench press technique for muscle growth is. A review paper by the good Dr. Pack at Strong by Science identified a few key characteristics of good technique for muscle building from the literature. First, we want to train a muscle in the stretch position. So reduce the amount of arching involved and potentially adopt a narrow grip. Second, we want a reasonably controlled eccentric and an explosive concentric, which jives well with our recommendations for strength. Finally, we want the target muscle to be the limiting factor and reduce the involvement of non-target muscles. If you're going mostly for pec and tricep growth, touch the bar somewhat higher on your chest. For front delt or tricep growth, touch the bar somewhat lower on your chest. If, instead, you'd like to consult a coach on your training, go to strongbyscience.com slash coaching, or to receive bi-weekly free email updates on the latest research, go to strongbyscience.com slash newsletter. Strong by Science, until next time.